My name is Tyler. I'm the technical advisor at Front Row. I uh, actually started out doing strength and conditioning and nutrition coaching for athletes and fell into cannabis by accident. And it turned out that cannabis was actually really similar to enhancing performance in human athletes. Different sets of problems, but they sort of rhyme. In 2000, 11 and 12 when I started, most of the growing practices were things that people had done for years and passed down from grower to grower. And there wasn't really any scientific validation or real world testing of most of these concepts. At first, you're just doing whatever everybody else is doing and information flow is rather limited. But once you realize that you can apply the concepts of science and real world testing, you can start to run small experiments, you can try new things. Your system slowly evolve over time into uh, better ways of doing things. And you record data, run controlled trials, see what the experiment says, and if it works, you upgrade all of your cultivation facilities to doing that new thing, and then you repeat that process again and again and again. And so we did that process for years. We tried new technology when it came out and new practices and slowly start to refine things into a system that actually reflects a lot closer to what traditional egg crops do. And so the transition has been about applying scientific principles to cannabis cultivation and using the fruits of those experiments and also absorbing from other areas of knowledge controlled environment, agriculture, greenhouses, and other hydroponic stuff. And as we got access to better technologies and monitoring systems, methods start to improve. Once you can measure new things like substrate water content and precise environmental parameters, temperature, humidity, VPD, you can start to manage those things. What gets measured gets managed. So around like 2016, been scaling up, we're using CO2 and our facilities are now completely sealed rather than using air exchange to cool the rooms and remove humidity and bring in CO2. We're now using air conditioners and sealed facilities, we're providing CO2 directly to the plants and we're getting our first crack at water content sensors. I think in 2016 was when I got my first Grodan GrowSense sensor, which was just like a couple of prongs and a device you stuck into a pot. And then you can go with a handheld meter 24 hours later, download all this data, you plug it into your computer and there's like an, an Excel file and you can look at all of the data manually in a list. It's just like a list of values <clears throat> and it samples every five minutes. And from there, we started getting better and better management systems to the point where we're at now, where you have real-time monitoring 24-7 of temperature, humidity, VPD, root zone temperature, water content, substrate EC. We do runoff monitoring once a week. Using all of these different techniques, you're kind of in, we're all in an arms race, basically. Everybody's competing with everyone else to have a small edge. So you're using R&D to do small experiments to try to gain a little bit more yield, a little bit more quality or to cut costs. And every time you get a gain, you adopt those principles to your production facilities. And if there's new technology, you have to try it because if you don't, somebody else is just gonna pull ahead and be producing better than you are. There used to be really almost no books on cannabis cultivation in general, and the best source of information was to go on a few online internet forums and try to dig up answers among people that knew what they were doing. So we spent a lot of time online reading forum threads and trying to infer good information from that because there wasn't any solid resources. You could learn about plant physiology, but you couldn't learn about anything specific to cannabis. That's really changed in a couple of ways. One big change is Instagram democratized huge amounts of information because as cannabis cultivators became confident that they could go on Instagram and not get in trouble, they started putting huge amounts of information on there. Technique, growing methods, photos of how things work, different equipment configurations. This allowed a lot of information to spread. And it's gone further now where we can have several books that are dedicated to cannabis cultivation techniques. 
science, practices, methods. We've made our online course, technician training, grow guide. You can go on our website and look at front row articles that go in depth in very specific ways about cannabis cultivation, the technology, the nutrients. None of that existed 10 years ago with the depth of information that we have now. I write our information and educational materials for the website. So that's the blog articles, our grow guide, uh, feed charts, fertilizer calculations and recipes and our online technician training course. And then I do consulting for large customers, uh, which could be anything from troubleshooting to optimization and all parts fertilizer related and fertilizer adjacent. So irrigation, fertigation, and environmental control. One of my friends became the general sales manager for Front Row and was like, you should try this fertilizer. And so I ran a bunch of trials with Front Row and ran it side by side with a bunch of different nutrient systems. And the front rooms always produce the best quality and the best yields. So for me, it was just sort of like a bit of a ruthless, like A, B testing, see what works the best. Um, where am I making the most money per square foot? For each harvest, we do pretty close batch tracking. So we're looking at grams per square foot, the total duration, and the average sales price. And the formula that combines all of those things, you get an output metric that's something like, how many revenue dollars are you getting per square feet of cultivation space per day? And gives you kind of an apples and apples comparison of lots of different fertilizer formulas. And you can look and compare them and see what fertilizer formula or what methods give us the highest revenue per square foot per day. I think the things that are most important in how I've set our methods and methodology is looking at efficiency. How much labor does it take uh, to produce for a given amount of square footage? Your production metrics, which are quality and yield and just ruthlessly working backwards from that, trying different things and seeing what works. And it's not the only way to grow well, and there's lots of people that do things differently, but growing in some sort of inert medium, cocoa or rock wool with precision drip emitters, substrate monitoring gives you control in a way that you don't have with most other systems like growing organically or in soil. We can look at what we're doing. We can measure a lot of different parts and that makes producing quality products consistent and reproducible. And that's really the hardest part about different methods is finding something that you can just do consistently that continues to work rather than shooting and missing and having to refine. And One of the good parts about growing for a long time is I've f***ed up in every single way imaginable. And when you do that, you learn a lot of what not to do. Each facility messes up in unique ways. Biggest problems that I see really commonly are just canopy management problems. One of the first principles that we're always trying to adhere to is we're trying to maximize bud sites per cubic foot of canopy. We're taking our, our total area, our length and width of canopy and the depth, and we want to have the maximum number of bud sites above a certain PPFD level where they're achieving enough light to produce quality flower. And to do that, you need to have plants that are both spaced appropriately in terms of, in terms of your planting density and vegged for the appropriate amount of time given the amount of space they have. So there's a ratio between all those things. This involves planning out your entire cycles far in advance so that you know, okay, if we have 0.5 plants per square foot in our flower rooms, then we're gonna plant our clones, we're gonna veg them for two weeks, and then those plants, by the time we move them into our flower rooms, we're gonna flower them, and during stretch, they're going to finish at a size by week three or so, that's filled up the canopy space at the appropriate density. I see this go wrong in two ways, if you have not enough plant density uh, or veg time, and you have gaps in the canopy, then you have photons. They're just hitting the table and they're being wasted. 
And each one of those photons that's not landing on a leaf and photosynthesizing is wasted yield potential. On the other side of it, you've got canopies that get overgrown where plants are competing with each other. And as soon as you have plants that are overlapping each other significantly, you're triggering things like a shade avoidance response, which is gonna force the plant to start building more stems and leaf to outcompete and outgrow the plants next to it, rather than partitioning that energy into what we really want, flowering sites and cannabinoids. One of the biggest mistakes is not considering how the plant's reacting to its spacing and how it's gonna partition energy. And either having too crowded or undercrowded canopy, it's not optimizing overall. A common problem that I see is not matching the demands of different parts of your environment. So now that we can run high PPFD lighting with LEDs at levels that were not possible 10 years ago, say we're at 1100 or 1200 PPFD, we need to make sure that we're supporting that light intensity by providing enough water and nutrients and all of the other factors. So you could run a room really well at 800 PPFD and the environmental demands for that are gonna be a lot different than if you're running at 1200 PPFD. So if somebody's running really high light intensity, they're generally gonna need a higher EC because the metabolic demands are gonna be higher. They're gonna need to irrigate more frequently and in higher volumes to match transpiration rates. Maintaining water quality and water cleanliness is another common problem in facilities. So each facility has somewhat unique source water. It could be well water, it could be municipal water, rainwater, and whatever that is, we recommend testing that, get in your baseline data, and then taking steps to mitigate any issues you might have. And that might mean sanitation to lower microbial load, filtration or reverse osmosis to bring down the EC, or any other number of steps to make sure your water quality is consistent year round. I see a lot of facilities not doing this and it can cause sort of mysterious seeming problems because they're doing just fine for months or a year and then eventually they have some accumulated buildup or a seasonal change in water that causes a problem to show up and they don't think it has anything to do with water quality because they haven't changed anything. But it's a problem of accumulated damage to their system or some change that wasn't quite visible. So regular measurement and then treatment to make sure it stays consistent can prevent a lot of problems. And in the end, this cashes out as higher average yields over the course of a year. So when you're looking for a fertilizer, you're looking for something that balances simplicity and ease of use with adaptability to different plant stages and demands. And with Front Row, we've got a three-part fertilizer, which allows us to adapt stage by stage to alter both the EC and the macro and micronutrient ratios. This lets us give during certain stages or certain strains that might require more nitrogen because you want them to grow bigger, you can give them more nitrogen. There's also a bunch of research that's come out in the last five years that shows how we can limit nitrogen at certain stages to steer the plant towards producing more secondary metabolic products like trichomes, terpenes, and secondary cannabinoids. Rather than just giving somebody a feed chart and fertilizer and setting them loose, we try to make sure that they have all of the things related to fertilizer usage also dialed in. So that might mean getting on a call and talking through their entire system to make sure that the front row fertilizer is gonna work appropriately with their equipment, with their lighting, and making any adjustments that we need to for that. And sometimes it's site visits. When we do site visits, we'll usually go stage by stage through each area of cultivation from moms, cloning, veg, flower, and fertigation and look for limiting factors. So in this facility, what's the bottleneck? Where are the constraints that are gonna be limiting them? And it's a little bit different at each place, but if we can find those limiting factors and then address them one by one, taking them off the board, it's usually the best strategy. And we can do that by looking not just at fertilizer recipes, but looking at the cultivation facility holistically and adjusting systems as needed.